afternoon, well of Ami. Thank you for joining po. The well of Ami po is from Tokyo. Hi, Tito Ding. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar one. I'm Carmelita Nuki, the Executive Director of DAWN and the President of the Philippine Migrants' Rights Watch, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. But first, I would like to talk about our um, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected all sectors of society including migrant women returnees and those in the destination countries displaced from their respective workplaces. A major issue currently 
confronted with health due to distress and possible trauma brought by the pandemic. Many migrant women, many migrant women workers are forced to return home scarred or trapped in the country of destination, afraid and anxious for their individual welfare and well-being as well as that of their families. In this regard, partnership with the British is organizing series of webinar consultations starting this October until February 2021. Today's webinar number one is on mental health and psychosocial support for migrant women returnees and those in the destination countries amid the pandemic. So to start this afternoon, I would like to Professor Aurora Habate de Jos, the president of the Don Board of Trustees and the senior project director of WAGI for her welcome remarks. Professor Oye, please. Okay, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, let me just uh, express our most, uh, our greetings to all the participants and of course our gratitude to the British Embassy for enabling us to hold this series of uh, webinars. Uh, so on behalf of our Board of Trustees, of which I am the president, uh, uh, let me just welcome you on this uh, uh, webinar series. Um, just a little background about the Dawn uh, Asan organization. It's been around for almost 30 years now, uh, Mel? No, 25, 25 years to be exact. Almost and uh, yeah. it has been founded um, it's been focused on the issue of uh, uh, Filipino Japanese children and uh, helping them to adjust to, uh, to the life without fathers and sometimes without guardians. And so uh, from that uh, first uh, focus of, um, of um, dawn, uh, we expanded into looking at the plight of returning migrants. No? Uh, including domestic uh, uh, workers, you know, particularly women. And it's been extending uh, quite a bit of assistance in terms of livelihood as well as psychosocial uh, assistance. So I might uh, uh, just to remind us that the Philippines is been around as a top migrant sending country in the world. We have over 10 million Filipinos working or living in more than 200 countries and territories. Um, and the policy of contract worker migration has been around for more than 40 years. In fact, we will be celebrating a milestone of the 50th anniversary, I think, uh, two years from now. Um, we know that Filipino domestic workers have been quite in demand in many countries, mainly as domestic workers, from Saudi to Italy, and nurses in London, Jeddah, and New York and as engineers in the oil refineries of uh, the Middle East. Um, and uh, as such, any crisis such as, uh, you know, political and uh, conflict uh, elsewhere in the world, in many parts of the world, uh, and uh, particularly health uh, crisis such as uh, this kind of pandemics affect migrants inevitably. And uh, for that reason, um, we, the Philippine Migrants uh, Network, as well as Dawn, are all involved in trying to respond to this new pandemic, which is quite uh, different from the rest of the crisis faced by our migrant workers. Um, we have uh, large numbers of migrants wanting to uh, come back to the Philippines, as well as those migrants whose, uh, whose jobs have been uh, terminated as a result of uh, the pandemic in other countries. Uh, so our issue now is how do we cope with uh, hundreds of thousands of Filipinos that are coming back? Uh, uh, to be exact, 338,753 have uh, returned so far and more are expected to come. Uh, so with these unprecedented numbers, the government is faced, it's quite overwhelmed and is uh, uh, in many areas also in, uh, inadequate in 
trying to reintegrate workers with you know uh, livelihood programs as well as health and and uh, social services so uh, to respond to this to this crisis many NGOs have in fact joined hands in order to complement the efforts of government to respond to this immediate need so it's an emergency situation we're facing now so I'm very glad to be able to help open this uh, series of webinars uh, and uh, to be of assistance in an area that has not been attended to in in the last crisis or so uh, it's all uh, government response is only on social and uh, psychological assistance only a small uh, portion of the reintegration program and nobody really anticipated that this would need a much much bigger uh, initiative uh, so we're very glad our psychologists are here my colleagues from Miriam College to help us out uh, in helping Dawn to um, uh, to provide services much needed services to uh, our migrant workers who are faced with a lot of issues such as loss of livelihood sometimes stigma coming from their own uh, from uh, other Filipinos who think that they're they are carriers of uh, the virus and of course the uh, readiness of our local governments to reabsorb them in their communities so with all these uh, issues uh, uh, that have surfaced it's no wonder that people are stressed uh, we have been staying at home for seven or eight months and we're also stressed uh, in a way but uh, you know uh, returning migrants especially women are like uh, coming from crisis and coming home to another crisis so uh, this is a uh, topic and this uh, concern for uh, social and psychological assistance is of utmost importance and has become in fact one of the priority issues that uh, we need to respond to so with that uh, thank you again and thank you to the British Embassy for helping us out thank you thank you very much professor Oi for that very um, short description about what Don is doing and for welcoming our participants. So now uh, we would like to call on Mr. Martin Norman, Secretary Political of Opening Remarks. Martin, please. Thank you, Mel, and thank you for those kind words, um, Professor. Um, good afternoon, everyone from a, a a very uh, gloomy, gloomy Manila, but it's great to see um, a few people dialed in from from around the world. Um, it, it's it's really good to see that. Um, this this is a, a first in a series of webinars um, that are aimed at providing psychosocial support for migrant women returnees and OFWs still um, in destination countries. Um, I think it's a really important topic and it, the UK's partnership with the Philippines is, is one that's been anchored in gender equality and, and women's empowerment for, for um, at least the last few years. And on that note, I'd really like to thank um, the super work that Dawn do, um, as well as your, your, your fantastic work, Mel. Um, it really is great. We've been, we've been uh, working with Dawn for a number of years as part of our work with um, the DOJ and the EACAT um, technical working group on migrant workers. So it's good that we're able to continue that relationship during these, these difficult times. Um, the, the Philippines, it's been my second home since mid 2018, um, but, but many Filipinos have gone the other way and made the UK their second home as well. Um, as you said earlier, Mel, there's, a, there's around um, 200,000 Filipinos, I think, living in the UK and, and working in the UK. Um, around 22,000 of those work in, our, work in our health service, which is the third largest group of uh, workers behind um, people from the UK and people from India. So it really is a, a testament to the, to the strength of OFWs. That there's so many over there and i think during during the pandemic um the work that healthcare workers provide 
side is is indispensable. So I'd just like to thank all the the Filipino NHS staff um, and honour their sacrifices because um, they really are on the the front lines and against COVID and uh, the unsung heroes during these um, these challenging times. I guess um, both the UK and the Philippines we've been we've been dealing with the disastrous impacts of COVID in in similar ways. Um, but I think it's true to say everywhere that the pandemic has disproportionately affected uh, women and exacerbated gender equality, and especially migrant women um, who are much more vulnerable to the to the impacts of COVID. Um, the UN, I think, recently reported that that female male migrant workers are more likely to contract COVID due to the precarious nature of their work and their limited access to, to healthcare facilities. Um, and they also have other risk factors such as job insecurity, abuse and trafficking, etc. Um, in fact, I think that report said women are said to be facing a, a triple jeopardy during the pandemic as they suffer as carers, of, as mothers and as individuals. And there's a real fear that this crisis is going to undo the, the, the 50 years of progress we've made in terms of empowering women. Um, and I think you'll all agree with me that we definitely um, shouldn't let that happen. Um, so it's for, it's for those reasons that um, this project and, and Dawn's project to support migrant women is, is crucial. Um, OFWs, uh, over 50% of them are women. And um, as we were saying earlier, they form the backbone of the, the Philippine economy, I think contributing up to 10% of GDP in, in recent years. They're, they're truly the uh, bag on bayani. Um, so we want to ensure that they're given the, the appropriate mental health support um, to enable their recovery and empower them to be the catalysts of change and role models in their families, uh, their homes and their communities as well. Um, I think the webinars after this one, they're going to discuss themes related to gender-based violence, stress management, um, and parenting techniques as well. I think they're all really relevant and, and timely, um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that they're going to deepen the conversation on some of these topics, which are often overlooked um, in terms of their impact on OFWs. Um, this particular webinar, I think, is, is, is really important as well um, in that it emphasizes mental health, that it's an issue that affects everybody. Um, and mainstreaming mental health, I think, is a shared endeavor. We, we really need to educate and involve more men like myself um, to advocate for, for women's mental health and women's rights in general. So um, without going on, um, too much longer. I just really want to thank uh, um, Dawn again um, for all their work in bringing this together. Um, it really is a pleasure to be partnering with such a great organization and we're really, really privileged to have such a, a super lineup of resource speakers as well. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much and I wish, um, I wish everybody a productive session. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you too for appreciating the work of Dawn and um, for your support. Um, I would also like to uh, talk now about the presence of uh, Reverend Leonardo Morada, uh, the Secretary of Dawn's Board of Trustees. Thank you, Ding, for joining us. And now um, we would like to invite everyone to join the group uh, screen chat. So we will have our souvenir for this uh, activity. May we request everyone to um, what open your camera so that we can see each other and we'll have a good photo. Weather. Uh, let's all let's all smile. Jane, can you please prepare? Yes po. So, can we open po yung camera po ng iba pa pong participants so that we can take a group photo. Okay po. Okay, one, two, three, smile! 
One more. Wait lang po. Oh, yeah. Sa pa po. One, two, three, smile. Ayan. Okay na po. Thank you po. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll be sending you a copy of this um, group chat. So now, uh, let, uh, let me introduce our speakers. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Jerry Jurisprudentia. He's a practicing licensed clinical psychologist and a licensed guidance counselor. He's also an associate professor and former chairperson of the Department of Psychology as an educator, he was the recipient of the President's Award for Teaching Excellence, the highest Miriam College Award. He also received recognition from the Center for Education Measurement and a sought after resource speaker. Dr. J was also the board of director of the Psychological Association of the Philippines for a couple of years. He obtained his PhD in clinical from the Ateneo de Manila University and his Master of Science in Guidance and Counseling from the De La Salle University. He's an advocate for women and children, a proud father of two daughters, and an internal migrant. Our second speaker, our second speaker is Dr. Pass. And Dr. Pass, where was Sorry. Dr. Pass is a certified development psychologist and a registered guidance counselor and psychologist. Currently, she teaches psychology and guidance at Miriam College. She served as department chairperson for the graduate school of the College of Education of Miriam College from 2010 to 2020. She was a board member, an executive secretary and treasurer of the Psychological Association of the Philippines. And from that's uh, from 2010 to 2016, she was vice president for academic affairs at the Colegio de San Lorenzo in Quezon City, and also served as president and member of the board of trustees of the ADHD Society of the Philippines. She has published a book titled "Educating Children with HD, ADHD: The Philippine Experience." She received her doctoral degree in Child and Family Studies at Miriam Valley, a Master's of Science in Educational Measurement and Evaluation at the De La Salle University. And also completed her Master's of Arts degree in Guidance Counseling in the same school. She holds a Bachelor's degree in Psychology at the College of the Holy Spirit. So now uh, let's have uh, for our first speaker, Dr. J. And after his presentation, Dr. Pass will do the presentation. So Dr. J will present um, his um, his presentation is on mental health and psychosocial support for migrant women and migrant women workers in destination countries amidst the pandemic while Dr. Pass will make a presentation on the coping uh, under the new normal. So Dr. Ye, please. Good afternoon to each and everyone. I just would like to check if my voice is uh, clear. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you uh, for that generous introduction. Uh, before I start, I would like also to, to thank Mr. Martin of the uh, British Embassy for sponsoring the series of webinars for migrant women returnees and migrant women workers in collaboration with DOE. No? So this is really a, 
very uh, significant uh, collaboration because uh, we are really addressing the concerns of our Bagong Bayani. Uh, this is very uh, ironical. They are the Bagong Bayani, but they are the ones who are in need of uh, assistance. But uh, anyway, I, I would like also to thank uh, Professor Aurora de Dios for introducing me to Dawn and uh, for uh, Ms. Mel for the continued trust and uh, cooperation. So my topic is uh, on mental health for migrant women, uh, returnees and uh, migrant women workers. This is very timely because uh, I think uh, they are now at the spotlight no? uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Okay, can you please, uh, uh, next slide please, uh, Ms. Shane. So I will not repeat what uh, Professor Oye mentioned earlier. She mentioned about 300,000 women migrant returnees. Okay, imagine Filipinas working abroad coming back because of this pandemic. And to uh, simply emphasize, no, uh, last year, the Philippine Statistic Authority made a survey and uh, according to that survey, there, are, there were almost 2 million women Filipinas working abroad. And I think that increased already, as mentioned by uh, Professor Oyi. And uh, not to discount how much they contributed to the economic stability of the government. No? If you, uh, coming from the data of uh, PSA itself, they were able to contribute 211 billion to the coffers of the government, okay? And these are women, one half of our migrant workers are uh, women ages uh, 16 to 40 and above, okay? Uh, next slide. So what are the conditions faced by our migrant women returnees and migrant women workers? Uh, before this pandemic hit the world, especially the Philippines, these women already encountered so many, many concerns and problems. Okay, so we mentioned some of them, uh, discrimination uh, in uh, host countries, uh, migration policies, working conditions uh, were not conducive, and they were not given uh, protection no, by the government of the host countries. So these are some of the concerns uh, experienced by our migrant uh, uh, women workers and uh, women migrant returnees. And uh, what else? So we cannot discount the fact that uh, the first thing that they will experience will always be language barrier in the host country and racial prejudice. No? I remembered the, in Saudi Arabia, there was a Filipina who was not even taught how to speak Arabic. And so because of this, her ability to move no, were, were constrained. So she couldn't go out, she couldn't call anybody for help because of language barrier. And uh, she was uh, uh, discriminated because her passport was uh, uh, confiscated by the employer and even her pass. No? And uh, not only to mention these uh, concerns, our women uh, workers were also uh, family members. No? Some of them left uh, children, their families back in the Philippines. Uh, there was one who came from a very remote province. She had five children because the husband was only a fisherman. Others uh, were single parents. Okay, so these were already uh, concerns that they experienced prior to the pandemic. No, uh, aside from illegal recruitment and even trafficking. Okay, next slide, please. Now, what happens? These things were aggravated. Either they were not resolved, but they were even, uh, uh, there's an add-on to the concerns that these, these uh, people face. No? Because of the COVID, they cannot anymore uh, do their work. Many of them were forced to uh, stop working. Some were even deported. No? 
they already were discriminated. And because of this COVID pandemic, they were also forced to go back to their host countries, no? to, their, to, their, to their countries, to the Philippines. And so uh, what will that mean? That means that uh, it will be less resources for the families of origin. No? So the lockdown added, aggravated their situation. They cannot even uh, uh, apply for work or they could even go to work because of this pandemic. And uh, because of this, they were isolated. Next slide, please. So what else? And this is uh, very serious among migrant women returnees because aside from the pandemic, they already lost their jobs, lost their livelihood. They are not protected from health. Uh, they had nothing to, to uh, pay for their, for their hospitalization. And they were stranded you know, uh, back home or even in the host countries of destination. So the COVID-19 added to the already existing problems of our migrant women workers. Uh, not to mention, they were also exposed to abuse and exploitation. Okay, next slide, please. So what else did they experience? Uh, next slide. Uh, now, what do they have in common, these migrant women returnees and these migrant women workers? And perhaps we can also add ourselves to this, is mental health, okay? Because mental health matters, okay? If your mental health is compromised, it will affect your abil ability to work. You have no energy. You become less productive. You are exposed to sickness. And uh, definitely, you might even be vulnerable to more serious mental conditions, okay? Next slide. Now, for, for our migrant uh, women workers, what do they have to understand? First, they have to understand the meaning of mental health, okay? So I, I am addressing this to our women migrant returnees and migrant workers. What is mental health, okay? This is very important. Mental health is not simply the absence of sickness. Mental health is actually uh, the ability of the person to realize her potentials, the ability of the person to manage her stresses, the ability of the person to be productive, the ability of the person to contribute to society. And getting sick is only one. And yet, if this aspect is uh, compromised, all the other aspects of mental health is also affected. That's why the, the, the image of mental health is gulong. No? So, katulad ng isang gulong ng sasakyan, pag nag-flat tire ang sasakyan, you will not uh, experience a comfortable ride Okay, it will be a bumpy ride and it will really be a tiring, exhausting journey. So what is mental health? Uh, okay, so please do remember, my dear migrant women returnees, mental health is also the same as well-being and wellness. Pag narinig mong sinasabing mental health, ibig sabihin, how is your uh, magandang kalagayan? No? How is your well-being? Okay. Because that is the meaning of mental health. Hindi lang nagkasakit ka. Okay? Next slide, please. And so when we say uh, about mental health, what does this include? It includes your physical health. It includes your intellectual health. And each of these will affect the other aspects. Kaya gulong siya. No? So kung masakitin ka, you cannot contribute to your family. If you are emotionally disturbed, you cannot think well. Your work is, is uh, jeopardized. So they all no, uh, are interconnected with one another. That's why it's important that our migrant women workers and returnees should understand ano ang ibig sabihin ng mental health. Okay? And this is also addressed to non-migrant workers like us. No? Okay, next slide. So what is the meaning of mental health? Your mental health is compromised if you don't understand the meaning of stress. Okay. And what is stress? This is the feeling that you 
experience within. There is a strain, a pressure, okay, that the person experiences. So what is the stressor? So the stress that you experience can be attributed to either the person, the event, or the experience that you went through. Okay, so itong stressor. Kaya dapat tandaan mo, ang mental health ko is affected by my stress. But what is contributing to my stress? Now, stress can either be internal or external. So katulad ng isang kettle, pag uh, nag-boil na siya, pag hindi mo siya kinuha sa kanyang nilulutuan mo, it will overflow. So uh, you have to take that out. Okay, so it is very important that you understand your stress if you want it to be healthy. Okay, however, if you don't understand your stress, this can also be distressing. So when you say it is a distress, that means to say you are already affected, you cannot work productively, you cannot think well, and your emotional well-being may also be compromised. In other words, your total wellness is affected. So you have to understand what is causing you stress and what is the stressor. Next slide. Now, we are not uh, aware uh, what is the, the condition of individual migrant women workers. They may look pleasant at the outside, they may be smiling, but deep down, no, para mababatid na ang, ang uh, ang kanilang PC. So, it is very important. No? The quarantine aggravated it aside from the fact that they are already lonely, they are already away from their families, they are already vulnerable, and uh, uh, they don't get the support they need. So suddenly, you might be surprised, no? like what a uh, uh, case that we have. She already came back to the Philippines, and she was quarantined for one month. And when she was about to leave, it was extended. And when she couldn't take any more the extension, she committed suicide. So nobody expected that, okay? So nabatid ang kanyang PC because they thought she was still okay. So this is the, the, the problem. And uh, the, the more serious problem that may be coming in will be the mental health. So hindi lang siya pandemic. Because remember, if 300,000 migrant women returnees are already in the Philippines and they are experiencing such distressing situation, just imagine that our mental health workers will also get overwhelmed. Sa pandemic pa lang, na overwhelm na mga doctors and mga nurses natin. No? Uh, as a matter of fact, we only have 600 psychiatrists all over the country. And if those 300 people get sick, okay, and they are all, most of them are in Metro Manila, we cannot address this anymore, and this will be a big problem to the government. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So what else? So the, the pandemic uh, aggravates the domestic violence of our migrant women returnees. Uh, experience. Hindi nila makatrabaho. They still get abuse from their partners because wala silang perang ibinigay to support or uh, they become insecure. No? Like uh, uh, the problem of our nurses. They, we, they already got their visas and when they want to leave, they were stopped no? by the government because there's no, no policy regarding this. So the insecurity, no? aside from the fact na uh, nangutang na sila, because they know that uh, uh, their families need this. And here, uh, they are, are not, not sure whether their work will still be guaranteed or not. No? Some even complain that once they couldn't report on the date itself, their uh, job will be uh, taken over by others. Ang iba naman, they experience, may bahay na po, pinaalis pa, sinira. No? So you see the insecurity of these people. They, they went abroad thinking that they will give a bet, uh, better future for their families and only to realize that this will all go to smoke. Okay, next slide. So what is very uh, challenging? Ano ang kailangan ng ating migrant women workers to face the pandemic? They need to understand that yes, there are external stressors. Yes, there are internal stressors, but 
the only way that you can uh, manage this challenge will be to take care of yourself. Tandaan mo, balikan mo ang sarili mo, alagaan mo muna ang sarili mo. This is very critical. Self-care. Okay? So, if you don't take care of yourself, your work will be affected, you cannot uh, do your chores, everything will follow. So, this is very important. So, what are the reactions of our migrant women workers and even migrant women returnees? So, kahit doon sila sa ibang bansa, with this pandemic, no? Uh, they are not accepted by the employers. Sa Italy nga sila, hindi naman sila makatrabaho. No? Or doon sila sa, sa Lebanon, but uh, the employers also uh, will not accept them kasi may economic crisis. So they experience anger, they experience anxiety and fear, and some experience grief or sadness. This is the impact of the pandemic aggravated by their already existing concerns. Next slide. So, how do you control this? No? So, as an individual, when you take care of yourself, what do you need no? to face this COVID-19 uh, pandemic and distressor? First, you need the ABC strategy. First, you have to be aware. No? Anong kamalayan mo? Sa nangyayari ngayon? No? Okay, what, what can you do? Okay. How do you balance this? And how can you control? So, these are the uh, ABC strategies that uh, we need to imbibe. No? Dapat i ang kinin natin ito. No? Baka before, we, we didn't realize this. Now, oh, so this is how I need to take care of myself. Very simple, A, B, C. No? So I have to be aware. I have to balance these uh, uh, stresses and I am in control. Next slide. So what happens when the pain or the stresses overcome our migrant women returnees and our migrant women workers in uh, distant countries, this will compromise their health, their security, and many of them uh, simply resort to suicide. No? I, I heard several cases in Lebanon. Sinasakta na sila, hindi pa sila makakonect with their families, and what did they do to stop the overwhelming uh, stress, they just simply end their life. So if the pain is greater than the resources of the individual, it will simply lead to breakdown. So another simple way of taking care of yourself is simply to remember the word anak. No? So pag sinabi mo anak, talagang atin ito. No? Ano ibig sabihin ng anak? And this is not a child. This is an acronym that stands for something. First, letter A, acceptance. May mga bagay na we cannot control. There are things that we cannot control, no matter what. No, we cannot control the, the pandemic. We cannot control how the spread will be. We cannot control how people think. But there is one thing we can control. And we can control our thoughts. We can control our behavior. We can re control our response to the situation. So. That is letter A. You accept that. So you make the, the, you draw the line. The second letter is N. Okay, nothing is permanent. Yes, we are in this pandemic. We are all together in this. But we know for a fact that time will come that a vaccine may be uh, discovered. And this will be uh, a chance to uh, live our hope. Or this is temporary. Okay, lahat tayo ngayon, ako nga, Seven months are in sa, sa quarantine, but we can still be productive even if we are staying at home. So you have to, to, to remember you know, that nothing is permanent. Okay? Letter A, your attitude of gratefulness. Okay? We still have to be thankful. We are alive. Buhay tayo. Your family is intact. You still have work. Yes, you, you may not have work now, but you still have the opportunity to work later on. So that attitude now, everything is possible, so you just have to simply be thankful. Kung patay ka na, wala ka ng trabaho, wala ka na ibigay sa family. But if you are alive, there will always be a second chance. And let's take okay, knowledge, so you know what you can do. Okay? So make use of your knowledge because knowledge is powerful. Kung alam mo kung paano gamitin, no? saan ka pupunta, anong contract ang dapat mong i-sign. 
No, you know that this country is not a welcoming country for migrant worker uh, uh, Filipinos. So you have an option: go to another country, okay? But uh, make use of the information because information is power, okay? Ko alam mo, it will lead you to getting sick. Why will you expose yourself, okay? So your power will prevent you to get exposed no? to, to risks. Next slide. Okay. So why is this very important? Because each migrant worker, okay, each migrant returnee has different ways of responding to the crisis. But how can we help them? No? Tayo, if you're a migrant worker now and you have taken care of yourself, they can cope well if they feel that they are safe. No, a migrant worker, even in a far country, can work well if he know, she knows that her family is safe back home. If she is also safe, that she is not getting sick. If she knows that she has access to social uh, support. No, there are organizations extending help. So she may be uh, not working at the moment, but because of this, they will be able to tie the problem. So, and then plus the fact that they have a sense of control, this will boost their immune system. Kumbaga, no? This will encourage them to uh, have their chin up and face the challenge. No? So this is very important, even to ourselves. No? Kung kaya natin ito, no? we are safe, then we can also assure others who may be losing hope, who may be uh, not in communication with their families because they are cut off. Then this is very important. Next slide. So, uh, aside from our, our awareness that uh, we take care of ourselves, no, we also need to protect our fellow migrant women workers. So how do you do that? Okay, you don't have to be a psychologist to be, to be helpful. You don't have to be a mental health practitioner. Okay, you just observe who are my colleagues who are vulnerable. No, they are cut uh, away from home and I am okay. So how can I help them? Okay. So especially if they have mental health conditions, if they are pregnant. Okay. So alam mong na they are they have they are uh, the, the the tendency is uh, they need help. So you look for these people around you, around your vicinity. No, they should, they may not be far. No. So look for them and listen to their concerns. No. So you may not be the one uh, affected. But by simply listening and joining with them, no, uh, I remember there was one from Hong Kong. Umiiyak siya kasi kasama niya na hospital. No, wala pa sa pera. The the employers uh, uh, abandoned them. So umiiyak sa niya. Alam ko nung niya. But uh, she said, I am the only one there listening. No, I am their only access. So she was the one after listening to their concerns. She was the one who connected them to the NGOs no? and asked for help. So you link them to uh, organizations that can assist them, okay? So, or either you yourself. So, it is not necessarily that you have to be an expert no? by simply practicing the principles of uh, PFA, the psychological first aid, then you can also be assistance to your fellow migrant women workers or fellow migrant attorneys. So, next slide. So, what is very important, the bottom line here is that our migrant women returnees and our migrant women workers need social support. And they can only weather this, no? If, and they can recover if they have the support before, during, and after the crisis. So, kilangan magtulungan, kapik bisig, no? Ang, ang nakakalungkot, no? So, we call them bagong bayani. And yet, some would call them the modern slaves, no? Like sa, sa Lebanon. Meron silang di, di kibala, what's that? Kibala system. But right. if you have uh, an employer who is sponsoring you, you will be deported or you will be left in the streets. No? So imagine, you don't have work anymore. They are exploited and they are also discriminated. So support is very critical. And not only that, no. next slide. Next slide. Dagdag pa ang COVID-19. So... So I hope that our migrant workers, after taking care of their mental health, identifying the stress and their stressors, they should not 
throw away the towel by risking their health and exposing themselves to COVID. No, because for the for, uh, right now we don't have the vaccination to uh, protect you. No, prevention is better than cure. If you can prevent from getting sick, you can still be productive. And so uh, this is very important. Uh, and uh, with this, I thank you for uh, listening. And I hope uh, I was able to assist, you know, uh, address your concerns. So these are the links. Okay, I, think I, I will be leaving this to the to Dome. And you can access, you know, especially for our women migrant returnees, they can always avail of the services of this uh, NGO and organization. Thank you. Dr. Jeff? Yes. Uh, we will be sharing the presentation and the different links to our participants and to other yes, networks who so. are uh, following us on FB Live. Yes. So now let's um, hear from Dr. Pass. Dr. Pass, please. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm just checking. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me now, ma'am? Yeah? Yes, okay. very clear. Thank so you. thank you again, uh, Don, for the invite. Uh, Doc J has said his thanks. Okay. Uh, I will validate and reinforce what uh, Doc J has been saying, but it will be more on the specifics no, of how we would cope with the new uh, normal. Let me share my slides, but a moment. I have problems with the slides, okay? Can you see it now? Now, 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 what's wrong with this? Okay. Are we good? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so... Uh, is it already full? Moment. Okay, are we good? Yeah, okay. So, uh, can you hear me? So, my topic is uh, the new normal. Because as of now, okay lang yung audio ko? Yes, pa. Okay. okay pa. Yeah, I'm calling it the new normal because whether we like it or not, no, this is already happening. And we also have to change the way we do things, no? Because this is part of how we will be able to cope and and first thing there is we're really in the new normal and when we talk about coping because it's to be using as of now no uh, it is our per, our effort to manage stress okay uh, solve the problem find a solution a new way of looking at the problem or perhaps to distract ourselves no from uh, what is going on and uh, when we look at this this is not a one time action but it's an ongoing set of responses. So, paga, ginagawa na natin ngayon to, no, to help us. It's been already like seven months, no? And if we haven't done anything to help us, definitely, we're already at the apex of uh, a bad mental health case, no? Like what uh, Dr. Jess has been saying. So, how have we been coping? Some had been, what, exercising, walking, dancing, some have been a plantita or a plantito, di ba? Yung mga iba, nag-meeting sila, nag-cross-stitch, gumawa ng face mask, all these things, no? To all, perhaps uh, help them forget, no? What is going on right now or maybe to cope, okay? So there are two ways of coping. It could be uh, the emotion-focused coping, 
whereby because you cannot do anything, no, there's still that acceptance no, to cope with the emotional effects of a stressful situation. So ang daming nangyari ngayon no, na parang I cannot cope with it, my emotions, uh, it's all negative, what will I do? So maybe others went into painting. Okay? I remember no, during that pandemic of March, I, I was so like shocked by how it has happened so fast. No, for the first two weeks, no, I, I brought out my painting by numbers no and i just focus on that just just for me to to have these positive feelings no others they go they make a journal no and write down their thoughts okay because usually uh, emotion focused coping is used when the problem has no real uh, solution now the pandemic there's really no solution that's why it's new normal we just have to accept it and move forward that's why it's usually associated with a negative adjustment because it is negative for us, no? Uh, we cannot go out, no uh, physical contact with our friends, no? It's, it's very different uh, right now. And part of it also is perhaps uh, like what Dr. J said, no? We have to uh, be with people, no? To talk about this. So I guess some of you mentioned may, nag exercise kayo to feel better because when you exercise, you have the happy hormones no that you release no neurotransmitters uh, this is the effect of exercise others they did gardening because with plants you can see life diba? like like uh, it becomes more alive so these are some of the things that you can do when we talk about emotion focus uh, coping uh, another type of coping is the problem focused coping no? uh, you try to confront and change the stressor so as of now, perhaps we cannot change. Nandiyan na talaga yung pandemic, no? But maybe the news, maybe you keep on hearing news, no? And maybe the news also uh, stresses you. So what can you do about it? Well, listen to music that is soothing instead of listening to the news. I've been listening to CNN and my goodness, the news would, would, would uh, stress me, President Trump and what it's doing. So now I, I, I'm not watching CNN anymore. Korean uh, Netflix na lang ako, di ba? Or feel good uh, films, no? It can also include seeking active help from others. Yung sinasabi nga, our psychosocial first aid, planning and taking direct action. So maybe we can come up with a what to do list. I'm stressed right now. What, what are the things that I can control, no? And maybe concentrate on that. And if you see this, this could be better for your health than emotion-focused coping. Why? Because you're doing something about it. Again, emotion-focused coping is okay for maybe uh, for quite some time. Hanggang kaya ng emotions mo. But later on, maybe uh, listening to good music is not enough anymore. And maybe you find out you find that you need to confront this person. So that that's when you go into a problem-focused uh, coping. Okay. Uh, this was uh, one of the strategies now when we talk about uh, strategic pause. Okay? Seb uh, Sebastian Vettel, if you're into uh, sports, car racing and all, he was a Formula One world champion. No? And he was a very great driver, always fast in the sport. No? But uh, there came a point in his life when he realized that always going fast forward, he would forget what is essential in life. So he said, he said this, no? sometimes you need to press pause to let everything sink in. And I guess this is what we're doing now. No? Parang nag-pause tayong lahat. And it could have been sa kapilitan talaga. But now we're, we're, we're doing this and maybe we're finding out no? that uh, there are things no? that there are, some, there are things that are good that has happened now. Okay? So others even say that maybe this is a blessing in disguise, a wake-up call for us. No, Now we have time to stop and actually spend time with ourselves, our loved ones. We're back in our home with our family right now. We have the opportunity to think, to consider or choose, reflect on our own personal values. What is important ba? Diba? Is it being together, being safe, no? instead of all these material things. No? We can uh, slow down and perhaps deepen our experience of being with ourselves for now, ourselves, our actions. The slowdown has given us uh, a chance to perhaps reconnect, nga kanina, with ourselves, with our family, 
our envisioned future that we haven't been uh, able to do for a long time. Okay, so I, I would want to look into uh, this acronym also. I have an acronym and how do we uh, help ourselves through such moments, no? So maybe the acronym SAFE, no? Uh, its purpose here is for us to cultivate feelings of safety and stability even amidst no, the challenging moments. So I, I cannot again emphasize S would stand for send yourself compassion and care. Yan nga, self-compassion and care. No? So while self-compassion might be like alien sa atin, mga Filipinas, no? migrant workers, mothers, parang alien yan because we've always been taught that think more of others, think of your children, think of your family before yourself. But again, no, the power of self-compassion and self-care has been well documented. Okay? That is very important for us, for our mental health. So one way that we might begin to send ourselves compassion is by recognizing that what we are experiencing now, yes, it's difficult, but we also remind ourselves that we are not alone. No? Sometimes during times of distress, we feel deeply alone with our fear, our sadness or grief. It was mentioned a while ago, but it can be helpful to acknowledge or to recognize that other people in our community, in the world, even if we don't know them, experience the same sadness, experience the same grief. They are also struggling in similar ways. Okay? And we can also be there for ourselves when we recognize no, that our suffering is part of a larger uh, shared humanity. We are all in this together. Kaya nakita rin natin napaka madami rin help na binigay ng mga uh, all these people around the world were helping one another. No? It was very natural for them to be helping. Because when we reach out to the parts of us that are feeling scared or hurt, this can help make our pain more bearable. So we can also look at, at this no, from a positive psychology lens. Okay? And let's look at its important uh, component and one component of positive uh, psychology would be uh, gratitude. No? Now studies on gratitude would say that it affects our cardiovascular and immune functioning. No? So the more thankful you are about these things, that as your immune system linear. So this will again prevent you from being sick. It is also a strength that is connected to satisfaction and happiness. The mere fact that you say thank you, di ba? Mag thank you ka lang, happy ka na. Somebody says thank you to you, you also feel happy. Okay, so that's very important, no? The, the feeling of gratitude and that, that's under the line of appreciate. Okay? Grateful people enjoy their work, okay? enjoy what they're doing because uh, they feel that, that they're blessed. So this is again uh, connected with A for appreciate, accept, and anchor. Okay? So when we look into this, no? because gratitude also helps uh, us find meaning and purpose to the changes in our routine, especially now during the lockdown, we are doing this uh, for the greater good, even if it means a temporary convenience. No? So after appreciating, uh, appreciating this gratitude, no, we accept and allow that whatever we are feeling is okay. Di ba? Maybe Netflix movie, it's okay not to be okay. So sometimes these are the things that, that we tell people nowadays, no? So while emotions may at times be highly uncomfortable because we seem that we're always stressed most of the time, no? We can often add fuel to that by feeling bad about what we are feeling, okay? So sometimes we have to, to remove the notion that we have to be strong or other variations of who will be there for my family? I am the mother, dapat ako na, di ba? But sometimes, it's hard to be always that kind of person. So what is important here as well is for us to, to also see, no? When we talk about anchor, no? Maybe we don't want also to be swallowed by all these negative feelings, no? 
So this is where the anchor comes in. So let's try to visualize. Okay, you see the picture there? So maybe let's just uh, say that we're off on a cruise. Diba? Namimiss na natin magbakasyon ngayon. So parang mag-cruise mag tayo. So we're there in, at the harbor and we see the big ocean liner. Okay? Then suddenly, nag-signal number four. Napakalakas yung ulan. No? We see lightning, waves, all the turbulent uh, uh, wind, no? and uh, the ocean liner starts to shake. No? So we see that. But let's visualize. Let's try to go, 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 go deep down no? underneath the water and see that there's an anchor there. There's that anchor holding the ship very still. It's very peaceful down there. No? So maybe when we look at it, yes, the pandemic is giving us all these turbulent thoughts, no? But we try to, to go deep inside our uh, inside ourselves and see, ano ba yung anchor natin, di ba? Who is our anchor in our life right now? Is it my family? Is it my, uh, is it God, Mama Mary, okay? Is it my uh, praying every day that holds me, uh, hold, holds me, uh, uh, holds me steady at this time, no? Is it my husband, my children, no? So, so try to think of the anchor that you have and this will also help you realize, no? That there's somebody or someone who would be constantly with you. So here, that's appreciate, accept, and anchor. Okay. Now we go to... Uh, uh, F, when we talk about uh, face the moment with all the resources that you have. Okay? So try to think of, of the time, no? Because positive psychology uh, focuses heavily no? on, on a strengths-based perspective. No? So during this pandemic, there might be a shared sense of helplessness as we cope with this uncertainty. But we know that we have our strengths, okay? And we find ways to use them during this time. So it will allow us no, to have a sense of empowerment and control. Because very important talaga yung, yung control, no? And for example, if you think that your signature strength is kindness and generosity, so maybe you find ways no, to utilize this during the pandemic or during this time. For instance, helping a neighbor, doing the yard work or maybe uh, doing volunteer work, okay? Helping people who are in need, in need, doing the psychosocial first aid, no? Because perhaps you're better off uh, in terms of your mental health than your colleagues. So maybe uh, this could be a way for you to bring out the strengths, okay? So we all have these particular strengths in our element and we are engaged when we utilize no, these strengths. Okay? So also call to mind uh, qualities within ourselves that, is, that has helped us through other challenges in our lives. Because I'm sure, aside from COVID-19, you had a lot of challenges before. No? So ano yung mga ginamit ninyong uh, qualities, strengths, that you are also using now? To help you cope with this situation. So I'm sure you say, you know, there was a time, grabe din ito, but I was able to overcome it. So try again to look into the past and try to, to use these strengths again. Okay? So you will find that perhaps you have courage, you have resilience, you have perseverance, diba? You have the patience, diba? Also call to mind, no? Resources that are available within your circle, no? including people in your life right now. Sinabi nga, we have a lot of uh, volunteers there, no? organizations, groups that you may reach out to, okay? And who would be available to help you. So you can write down in your mind no? all the inner and outer strengths that you have, all these resources, and you will find that, yes, you are not alone. There are a lot of people there who can help you. Okay. Uh, the next, perhaps, is uh, looking at uh, E. No, when we when we look into E, we say uh, engage in something here and now. So this is again the concept of uh, of flow. No, 
the present moment. Okay, so the, the concept of flow here is when we find ourselves not totally absorbed in an activity. Okay, we are one with the music, positive psyche, and Martin Seligman, no? You, we try to find an activity that allows us to bring no, our full attention into the present moment. If there is something that we can do about the problem at hand, we might choose to focus on the task. So what are some of the things there, di ba, during that pandemic, yung mga tao that TikTok, just for them to have a good laugh, okay? Maybe some of you uh, is thinking already of, of ano to, business online because na ano na nila, di ba, na, na perfect na nila yung kanilang recipe, no? Or maybe they had time to watch all these uh, recipes. No, it's something new to learn. Okay, maybe some of you did painting. Also, also yung uh, the plants. No, growing plants to make us feel good. No, I have the picture there of my sister. She's in the UK right now, working in a school. And what is she doing now? No, they liked her face mask. No, wow, it's it's very nasty. Sabi nila, now she's. She's sewing face masks for for the teachers because they like they like her face. Alam naman niyo tayo mga Filipino were very fashionable and artistic, no? And we found some uh, recipes online that that we did at, that we're doing now, no? To, to just let us focus, no, on the here and and now, no? The idea here is really to steady the mind, no, on just one activity. So that when the mind starts again to wonder, ma-anxious na naman tayo, di ba? And ruminate in many unhelpful ways, nagsa-self-pity tayo, all negative again, we bring it back to whatever no, we are doing again and again. So uh, bring, as many as, uh, bring as many as your five senses into that experience, the mind again will wonder, mag-ruminate na naman, mag-negative thoughts na naman, but the task on hand that you are doing becomes an anchor no? for you to come back to over and over again. Kaya nga, very important that you're engaged, you find something that gives you joy. Okay? Uh, so this is where mindfulness comes in, no? which has been defined as that awareness because we pay attention to what we're doing. No? And, and uh, we see things, no? We see things without being judgmental about it. So when we feel bad, we acknowledge, yes, we feel bad now. It's negative, but what can I do now? Okay. So the ruminating thoughts are the distractions that our mind may create. Yes, no? But again, engaging oneself fully at what is at hand, what is present, will always bring us back into our present moment. Okay. So... Uh, Klaus Schwab mentioned this. The pandemic represents no, a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. No? So I hope uh, at this time also we use this as, a, as an opportunity no, to look into our values, no, to take that pause and say, what is it that I have to do now? Because we've always been like rushing, rushing, so it's very important now. We have this time to pause and say, okay, what is my plan now? How will I help myself first so that I will be able to help others? So uh, I leave you with that, okay? And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Paz and Dr. Je, for those very significant and much needed information for all of us. Uh, so that we will have more time for the open forum, let me introduce our presenter, Mr. Froilan Malit. He's an associate at the Gold Labor Markets and Migration, a research UP Diliman Cipal Program, and a managing director of Rights Corridor, a regional news platform and research on migration and rights issues. Over the past decade, Froilan has lived and worked across the Gulf region, working as technical and migration policy consultant for a number of regional and international organizations, 
including the Abu Dhabi Dialogue, the ILO, and the IOM. He's an advisory committee member of the National Office for Arab States Migration Advisory Group and previously held visiting research position at the American University of Sharjah and Syed University. He has previously published numerous peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and policy papers exploring migration in the Gulf region. He holds degrees from Cornell University, the University of Oxford, and a migration certificate from the European University Institute. He is currently studying international relations in the Department of Police at Cambridge. So, Froilan, please um, facilitate now the open forum. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Carmelita, and to Dr. Oye, uh, the um, British Embassy for the support, as well as to our esteemed guests and our uh, fabulous speakers, uh, Dr. Jerry and uh, Dr. Maria Paz. Um, your presentations really are the much needed conversations that we need at the moment. Uh, and a lot of uh, Filipinos actually need to be, again, uh, very much aware of these uh, critical topics that you've highlighted. And uh, let me give a very quick summary of both of your uh, presentations and uh, start the conversation uh, with Dr. Jerry and Dr. Maria Paz. So as Dr. Jerry highlighted, uh, COVID uh, clearly exacerbated both the long domestic and transnational concerns of a lot of NGOs, specifically Dawn, um, and a lot of the religious community groups that we have, both in the Philippines and outside, which is the mental health of migrant workers, especially women. And at the moment, majority of migrant Filipino workers, especially women, are still in destination countries. And Dr. Oye highlighted that even if, uh, since a lot of our migrants have, haven't returned yet, our systems are already, quote, overburdened and inadequate. And this actually raises a lot of interesting governance challenges, a multi-level governance challenges uh, for the Philippine government and our very own institutions. Now, last uh, two weeks ago, um, I was in a conference uh, at Cambridge with the uh, WHO's Director General and Dr. Tedros, and he basically said uh, that the WHO is also not optimistic to even come up with a vaccine uh, from during the first quarter of 2021 and the United Nations also highlighted that it takes 12 to 18 months to even come up with a broadly available vaccine. And that actually creates a lot of challenges for sending countries like the Philippines. Now, Dr. Jerry also highlighted the different types of host countries, temporary sponsorship programs. He used various examples, Hong Kong, Saudi and Lebanon. And he highlighted how COVID has restricted the internal mobility of migrant workers. And in some cases, two host countries prioritize their locals over migrant workers. And with less institutional support and policy resources, both in the origin and destination countries, so in, in the case of the Middle East, for example, the degree of social welfare and mental health resources for you know, migrant workers like Filipinos are very limited, let alone the existing limited uh, mental health support that we have in our embassies. In Dr. Jerry's presentation, he highlighted sort of the lack of, you know, health officers or health attaches. Uh, that's something that's very crucial that has not been really addressed uh, in recent times. Now, um, the other ele important element that he talked about is this transnationalist sort of transnationalism effect. Uh, when migrant workers lose jobs, again, it has direct effect on these local households, you know, in the Philippines. And migration has empowered women. They give them this opportunity to go outside and actually work, earn, etc. But with COVID bringing them back in the Philippines, it changes the gender norms, right? Their ability uh, to support their families. And that in turn actually exposes them to abuse, uh, violence, and gender insecurities as well. And more importantly, as lockdowns and access to employment become very much intensified, um, both of our um, experts have highlighted, you know, 
the, the you know potential you know outcomes like you know, anger, anxieties, fear, and in some cases uh, suicide, and therefore the role of non-state actors like NGOs are becoming even more important. And the need now to think about the different types of sectoral collaboration and cooperation, both vertical or horizontal, become very, very important now. And Dr. Maria Paz actually's work, um, the way she talks about the um, emotion focus and problem focus, it, it made me wonder uh, how can we make these strategic, you know, training assistance more visible and more available uh, to a lot of Filipinos actually in the Middle East, um, in Asia, and Dr. Jerry's sort of approach, ANAC actually, is also even e equally important. And how do we actually create and develop collaborations with our experts in the Philippines and link them with destination countries, um, diplomatic missions that we had. So these type of mental health sort of um, um, insights and initiatives can become more accessible and hoping that these could actually mitigate a lot of these mental health risks that we face uh, for a lot of migrants in the host country. And lastly, I, I liked uh, Dr. Maria Paz, how she used uh, Swab's uh, words that now with the current COVID-19 context, we need to quote, reflect, reimagine and reset. And I think uh, COVID-19 again, um, has really forced us to rethink from within. And it's now really forcing our government to look at our part, you know, to look at our policies um, across time and space uh, in the long run. So thank you so much uh, for these wonderful presentations and um, we truly enjoy them a lot. Um, I guess like I want to open um, a very simple question uh, to our experts, to Dr. Jerry and Dr. Maria Paz. I, I think I want to start with Dr. Jerry. Uh, Dr. Jerry, um, having listened to your presentation, I think the, the initial question that I have in my mind is like whether you can describe Filipino migrants' degree of mental health awareness in the past and in contemporary times, how much of it has actually, has actually changed? And um, so, yeah, I, I think I want to start with that, uh, the conception of mental health. Um, and, and then we could go on with, you know, the institutional, you know, arrangements and et cetera. But I think I want to start with this, uh, with Dr. Jerry and Dr. Maria Paz. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, that is a very good question. First, uh, when our women, uh, migrant uh, workers uh, left home, they were full of hope they were very positive, okay? And uh, they were excited to reach their destination countries. But the, the, the problem was uh, once they were there, they didn't expect the kind of treatment they received, mm -hmm. okay? So they experienced discrimination. There was one in Qatar, I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, she was told by the host uh, employer, so you don't own yourself. We bought you from another. So in other words, you are at our mercy, okay? Another one in, in Saudi Arabia, the, the, the domestic worker said, you don't know anybody here. We can just kill you and your family cannot support you. So here they are with their dreams with them. And uh, now they didn't expect this kind of, of uh, challenges. So they already have that concern. They were expecting that uh, when they go back home, they are, their problems will be resolved. They will give uh, uh, realization to the dreams of their families. But uh, they found out that they, when they came home, they were even ashamed because they, the, the, the dream that they started to have simply disappeared. Now, they cannot come home anymore because with the lockdown, they are again restricted. So the pandemic even aggravated the situation, okay? Before they can still come home. <laughs> now they cannot even go home because uh, there are no flights, uh, their employer kicked them out. So they have to be uh, accepted yeah. by other, uh, migrant workers as well. So they have to be living together, but uh, surviving. So I think, uh, the concerns before were already there. They were trying to cope because at least they still have that opportunity to address. But the pandemic added to this. So to the effect that uh, uh, their, their movements were even more restricted. 
Okay? So, they cannot even send money back home. You see, their work was uh, lessened before they were working for one, five days. Now, their work is only two days. So, so yeah. that alone uh, decreases their financial support back home. And uh, they also need the money. <laughs> they cannot also... So, these are the challenges, uh, uh, Sir Foyla. No? Uh, but, uh, of course, not everybody seemed to experience this. No? Uh, there are also those who were very lucky. Their employers were very supportive. They gave them homes also. Uh, as a matter of fact, they even gave them investment money to start a new business when they, when they come back. But, uh, but generally, uh, what is happening is that still uh, work uh, situations are not addressed properly. They are still at the mercy of the host country, they are discriminated. There is even one in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the the uh, woman was saying, "Sir, sa bahay niya si Ulumanaka, yung employee na kahubad." And the excuse was, uh, "This is my home." <laughs> so and then that that employee would touch her, and then she couldn't complain because she would they, they would file uh, fake uh, accusations. So and because she is uh, also new, so she is really. Uh, vulnerable. So, I do not know what our government is doing to regulate because even the host countries don't have uh, regulations to protect our uh, domestic work, like in Lebanon, for instance. No? Yeah. They cannot get away with the Kabbalah system. And so, they were at the mercy. No? Uh, either you go back home with no money at all, ka pa. and then you cannot pay them back. So, you, then they would resort really to suffer more just to save face. So I think the, the, the different NGOs, the government, and the host countries should really work together to address this. Yeah. They, may, they may have pitans uh, help, like verbal help, but they don't really uh, do much uh, to really change the working condition of our migrant workers. So that's... Uh, the situation now for Ilan. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jerry, for that very uh, grounded um, analysis. Sure. And I think it's, it's a very important one. And in fact, um, in addition to what you said, some employers even use COVID to justify yeah. their decision not to give day off, right? Um, in host countries. So it becomes an interesting sort of strategy for certain employers to restrict this mobility. I mean, international rules have really, you know, influenced them in the past, but now with COVID, it creates, you know, a strategic sort of uh, approach for them uh, to limit it. Uh, by the way, um, the, the, the question is actually open uh, to all other participants. You yeah. can please raise your hands or even copy and paste it in the chat box. But Dr. Jerry, uh, that, that is a critical point. And I think it's quite rampant across the Middle East region. And with, with your grounded approach, uh, Dr. Maria Paz, I wonder what do you think of it too? Like, you know, in the past and now and how it's actually changing and, you know, impacting not just, you know, the lives and mental health conditions of Filipinos, but also our policies. How should we actually yeah. think about our policies, you know, in the long run? Yeah. A lot of intersecting factors for Ilan, right? Policies from the government has to really be in place, no? And even we look at it now, even in the future, future now mental health will be something uh, that would really overtake us because we're experiencing it now, but that will still, we will still have the effects, no, of the COVID with our mental health for the years to come, no? So my my bias really is on families get what I mean building resilience okay uh, keeping that connection so that when traumatic events happen bad things happen uh, the person has that resilience so i guess it's also very important looking uh, in a philippine setting no that Sana, kung ako lang, that would be the last option. Get away from our country. Sana, yun yung last option. Diba? Because there's no place like home when you are empowered. But we understand that sometimes it cannot be helped. No? So, we build that capacity no? sa, uh, our own self, resiliency. No? It's very important also sana sa mga 
host countries, people there, give us the real scenario. Kasi kung misa nagkwekwentuhan tayo, I think it's also part of the Filipino culture. We just talk about what is good. Okay? And, and people will think, oh, swerte siya, nandito siya, etc. But if we, if we give the real picture, it may, it may be this, it may be that. So the more informed the, uh, our uh, countrymen are about working abroad, the, the better decision they may be able to make. So all things should be in place. So that's my take on that. No, th thank you, Dr. Maria Paz. I think these expectations really also exacerbate, right, the mental health uh, effects on our, you know, Filipino workers. And I think Dr. Jerry highlighted this. In the past, you can actually go to other countries and say, let me start all over again. But now all the labor markets have closed and these will be closed, you know, for a few more years to come. And that actually would create a lot of challenge for our government. And I think um, some questions from uh, Che from CMA uh, could further add a little bit more into this uh, complexity that you just mentioned. Che from CMA. Yes, hello. Good afternoon. Sorry, I can't turn on my video right now because it is slightly broken. Um, I'm Che, a caseworker from Center for Migrant Advocacy Philippines. Um, before I ask my question, I'd like to commend the two speakers for a very insightful presentation. I learned a lot from the pressing concerns of the women migrant workers and the mental health makeup of a person. Um, this question goes for Dr. or Professor Jerry. Um, he mentioned in his presentation that one of the services gaps is insufficient um, budget support given to government agencies handling women um, women migrants, specifically no mental health desk in Philippine embassies. So um, I hope you could expound on this or clarify because I believe our embassies, they have their own shelters and social workers who could provide stress debriefing or PFA psychological first aid. So how exactly the mental health desk um, which I believe a very promising intervention could complement or supplement the current welfare services that our embassies are already offering. Okay. Uh, thank you for that uh, verificatory question. Uh, Actually, uh, we have one student who made her dissertation paper and she, and she interviewed uh, the different people from the different countries and asked them, what is the, the condition, the, the help that our embassies provide for our Philippine workers? And uh, even the NGO supported, uh, supporting these uh, workers mentioned that they don't have a professional mental health worker connected with our embassies. Most of them are legal experts mm -hmm. on the labor law, but not so many are licensed mental health professionals assisting our, our market. And uh, for example, like counseling, you cannot ask counseling from a lawyer. <laughs> he will only give you a legal advice. And even from our NGOs abroad, yes, they may have, but they are not professionals. But siguro what they give is a PFA, psychological first aid. Yes, that is very important. We also recognize that. Yeah. No? especially if they can manage. But if our mental health workers are in advanced mental uh, health condition, these people are also constrained from assisting. No, there was one case, uh, the employer, because she really broke down. No? Uh, so, uh, nagwawala siya sa bahay sa Saudi. So, kinvideohan siya ng uh, employer uh, to prove that, tingnan niyo, we, we are not uh, giving her uh, her salary because she is not helping anymore. So she was sent to a mental institution uh, in Saudi Arabia. So the family were, were surprised because they haven't heard of her. But when they were able to locate her and they were able to bring her back, okay, and now she is back with her family, her mental conditions uh, was gradually, well, she gradually uh, recovered. So in other words, uh, unless 
the condition is not addressed, no? the person is at the mercy. Tao ka lang eh. Okay? Uh, if your, your resources is not enough, are not enough to cope with the pain, with the problem, uh, sexually abused ka na, hindi ka pa uh, sinasahuran, and then hindi ka makalabas. So, and then hindi ka ba makatawag sa embassy? So, and our embassies, ilan lang ang kwa? There are many, uh, to mention, thousands and thousands of migrant workers. Ilan lang yung atin mental health workers in the embassies uh, itself. Kunti lang, isa, dalawa. So, uh, this is uh, perhaps uh, uh, the problem right now that uh, I do not know how our uh, government... You see, imagine, uh, sang last year lang, 211 billion ang in-contribute ng migrant workers natin sa coffers ng government. And yet, pitans lang ang binibigay pabalik. No? We are even sending them to the labor, but we are not even pre prepared to address and assist them. Yeah. So, so, this is a challenge. Uh, for, for all of us, no? uh, how will they address this? But of course, uh, it, in, in, on my end, I am concerned with the mental health because we want to equip them, like what the Dr. Pa said. We have to prepare them. Kahit na regardless of the situation, they know how to bounce back. Okay? They know how to take care of themselves. Okay? So, if you do not have. so, if you are strong enough, I think you can recover fast because we believe in the resilience of, of each one. That's my thing. Doctor, thank you, Dr. Jerry, for that very, very important point. I'll add a few more points into that, but I think Dr. Maria Paz can also add a little bit more perspective. Than that. Yeah, uh, there's a question here from Dr. Dang about certain, uh, a certain policy, you know? So, so maybe we know that there's a policy there, but maybe how it's really working, if it's like, how many percent is it really working, right? And what we would want is like, at least, uh, 98 to 101 percent working, so that we won't have all these horror stories, right? And all these distressing uh, narratives of our migrant workers, no? So uh, that's very important, really. And again, uh, they really have to know the situation. The information is very important for them. Okay, so maybe that's something that I can add to what uh, Dr. J mentioned. I, thank you, Dr. Maria Paz. And also to, to respond to uh, Shea's question from CMA and Dr. Jerry's um, insights, I work in the Gulf. I work directly with our labor attaches mm -hmm. uh, in Qatar and in DUE, for example. Uh, now, some labor markets, they have a highly socialized, you know, healthcare system where mental health is also possible to access yeah. in the host country. But for some, certain host countries like the Middle East, it's actually not accessible. And it's often only accessible to the local population. Mm -hmm. So the pressure is on for our diplomatic missions to extend you know, such mental health support. Now, if you want to understand, share what's happening within these embassies and cons, I worked with the Philippine ambassador to, the Abu, to Abu Dhabi for three years. And I was able to see sort of the structures right, of these diplomatic missions. And Dr. Jerry is right that the ratio of frontline staff versus the proportion of migrant workers, it's, in, it's basically institutionally impossible to extend such support. Because as Dr. J Jerry said, the focus is actually often more on protection and promotion and now repatriation. Now our welfare officers, you know, are really working tirelessly here, yeah. um, depending on the, the number of sectors that we're focusing here. So in the Gulf, there's a lot of uh, focus on domestic work. So mm -hmm. all the resources, uh, our ambassador even said, 95% of our resources in Abu Dhabi get spent on protecting domestic workers. I'm referring to protecting, meaning trying to claim unpaid wages, for example, yeah. chasing employers for contract violations, but not necessarily on mental health. Mm -hmm. Although these services are you know, being extended to Filipinos, but the proportion, let alone the awareness, uh, yeah. is actually very difficult. I think we do have a Polo uh, Oho official from Tokyo. I think it would be very interesting to hear uh, what she has to say about Shea's question from CMA. Um, okay, nanunyot mo si Polo Owa. Uh, 
our Polo Owa, uh, official from Tokyo. Um, I, I think we do need a sort of an inside perspective uh, as to what really happens inside. I think it's a critical question to understand uh, institutional capacities in the host countries. Um, hello, Paul. Okay, um, we will move to another question, Paul. Um, I think we're not an official acting from uh, Polo Owa, Tokyo. Um, okay, so Dr. Jerry, do you want to add um, additional insights, Paul? So, uh, uh, what Dr. Maria Paz and She and what I said uh, related to the uh, question he shares from CNA. Uh, Siguro sa structural system, like uh, for example, in, uh, in the Philippines, no? uh, mm -hmm. we don't even have an accurate number of our migrant workers going out and coming mm -hmm. in. So, mm -hmm. conflicting. So, kaya how, how are we able to monitor this? No? Kasi iba yung data ng lumalabas sa, sa dole, iba-iba naman ang pumapasok. Yeah. And sometimes they don't match. No? So, that alone is a big problem kasi we don't have one database wherein we can monitor and assist them. Yeah. So, conflicting na. So, if, if we don't have this, problem lang kasi our, our report will be inaccurate. So, that, that alone. So, that is already structural no? aside from the other uh, challenges. No? And uh, they are coming back. Our mental health uh, sector is not also prepared. Sa COVID pa lang, yeah. hindi na nila kaya. Nadagdagan pa ng mga migrant workers natin. Na, so takot na rin sila pumunta ng hospital. Kasi baka makuha pa nila ang, ang virus. Uh, so, and they will uh, also uh, infl uh, uh, affect the families. So that will again aggravate. Iwala pa sila pang bayad. No? Sa, kanilang uh, hospitalization. Uh, so these are just some cases, very, very real cases that I, I, I noted that uh, can already uh, perhaps uh, yeah. exacerbate uh, that the situation. Mm -hmm. Then yung sabi pa na may mga abuses pa. Okay? Uh, may isa kong migrant worker na ang anak niya, uh, kasi wala siya, yun pala ang anak niya ginagamit ng asawa niya. So, mm -hmm. na-found na out niya lang because uh, nabuntis yung anak niya. <laughs> so, mga ganun. So, no, I agree, Dr. Jerry. I think the, the issue of institutional constraints, it's so real in the host country. And as you said, 600 psychiatrists in the Philippines. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to wrap around that in my head with millions of populations that we have. But let me go to Dr. Dang uh, San Gabriel of PUP. Um, I think uh, Dr. Dang um, from PUP. So, okay, while, while we're waiting for her, Dr. Dang, I think your question yeah, is, she's, she's moving ahead to the question, yeah, actually, but, but it's an important one. You know, what specific policy uh, would you recommend to help our migrant women in distress? But let's anchor this within sort of an institutional standpoint. Like, how can we do this? So, Lucita uh, Villanueva, for example, mentioned that perhaps DFA staff should be de deployed to the various, po various posts, um, and should undergo skills enhancement related to uh, mental health, for example. Um, I do know that in Dubai, meron ditong mga attaches and they're considering um, deploying health attaches in the future. But I wanted to know uh, basically your opinion on Dr. Jerry and Dr. Maria Paz. Um, how do you actually imagine or even uh, envisioning you mga ganitong policies that, are, that need to be unfolded very soon, given you uh, issues that are COVID-19 um, impacting uh, migrant women workers in the Middle East, Asia, or so Europe. So Dr. Jerry. Uh, 
just to to put things in context, no. So we only have 600 uh, psychiatrists all over mm -hmm. the country with 10, 100 million Filipinos. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. we only have 3,000 uh, licensed guidance counselors. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, even these guidance counselors are supposed to be uh, professionals. And even mm -hmm. our Dep ed needs uh, 40,000 guidance counselors. <laughs> In the local setting. There is a need for an aggressive training no, on PFA for our uh, non professional uh, volunteers because they are at the front lines no, uh, to, to strengthen alone the coping skills of uh, individual workers can already at least no, uh, protect. Because once they can protect and they can uh, also uh, identify other migrant workers who are in need, that can replicate no, and prevent serious things from happening. Mm -hmm. That on that end, no, so aggressive uh, uh, training on mental health, uh, mm -hmm. because this is really a crisis not only of the world but even uh, for ourselves. No, the country is. Uh, experiencing and much more of our migrant workers who are uh, in destination countries they had nobody to turn to they really mm -hmm. are uh, at the mercy no? vulnerable mm -hmm. okay so mm -hmm. kaya uh, i don't know what else can siguro sa, sa mental health there we can really be assisting but on other concerns like uh, collaboration change of yeah. laws uh, labor laws of we can we can do this pero kung ang host country naman wala silang labor laws like in uh, Lebanon <laughs> the, mm -hmm. or in uh, the Middle East mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. our our workers are hopeful that once they are there they are protected pagdating doon kukunin ang passport so ano wala rin so they are still at the mercy uh, so kaya even if kaya siguro resilience lang talagang itetray natin sa kanila so that they can cope with the challenge. Okay? So, yun ang ma-recommend ko. Thank you, Dr. Jerry. I think um, our official from Polo Owa, uh, nandito na po siya. But I want to add what Lan said. Uh, there are seven social welfare attaches currently deployed in destination countries. Riyadh, Jeddah, Dubai, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Kuwait, and Qatar. Uh, so our official from uh, um, Polo Owa, Tokyo, um, these issues of institutional capacities have often become a, a highly contentious and even politicized uh, sort of debate, even among migrant communities in the Middle East. So I wonder, ano po yung response nyo, our official from um, Polo uh, in Qatar, uh, in Tokyo? Hi good, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Actually, hi, Proilan. Good to see you again. We've you met already again. in Abu Dhabi yeah. before, right? Uh, yes. Dr. Pass and Dr. Jerry, good afternoon and so well. Good afternoon. It's so nice to be with you today and this afternoon and even uh, I learned a lot from the topics today. I've been in Abu Dhabi before and what Mr. Poilan is telling, really we have to do something about our bagong bayani, which we call them, especially the women who are so vulnerable with with the situations, especially the domestic helpers. Uh, I, I've experienced a lot with all those workers I've been handling with when I was the welfare officer there. Although we had a social welfare, but I think uh, somebody must be assigned in every post, especially in Middle mm -hmm. East, who can really handle those workers who are really distressed as we can say so. Actually, it's, uh, it's really helpful if we can assign someone who can deal with all the depression of these workers because I'm dealing with workers who have been raped, physically abused, mentally tortured, tulad po ng sabi ni Sir Jerry, because of the kafala system, in the Middle East, they own the workers as their slaves. So at least 
they need something when they went to the embassy seek the embassy's assistance we cannot just only we can give them is uh the sympathy uh, we can hear all those uh problems they are sharing uh lahat ng experiences they've been into only we can give our ears for them to hear them but actually we cannot mend those broken uh, yeah those broken heart and even those broken spirit uh kailangan po talaga ng somebody or in whom they can really ventilate it kasi po sa pag-uwi nila still oo nga dala-dala nila yon the stress mm-hmm. itself yeah, talaga yeah, yeah. they have to i was able to deal with this is a, a real scenario where in when i was still in Hawaii. i deal with i i have deal with a rape victim she's married and she got pregnant the husband did not know she was raped by her employer the husband did not know what happened to her she she delivered her baby in abu dhabi and she left the baby there and when i told her you have i i i i, I contacted some non government agencies in the philippines where in if ever she'll be home back in the philippines she can go into the process of healing first. yeah yeah but the problem is because she miss her family she immediately contacted her husband and because she miss her family when they met on the first time and her husband tried to have sex with her that trauma from the rape experience she had bigla po tong lumabas and she just uh she told me that sumigaw na lang siya ng sumigaw and shaking everything so she's calling me out from the philippines telling me all these experiences and i told her you need to go to the ngo of which i have uh, referred you but later when the husband learned what really yeah. happened to her when she opened it up the family broke up and you know what happened uh, until now i'm really sad and i'm really uh, affected by yeah. this because yeah, i need yeah. to learn from her family she committed suicide see yeah if yeah. ever she was in kuwait before and somebody was able to deal with those trauma yeah at least before she went home uh, kahit pa paano ay na-address natin ito. And so with Abu Dhabi, still, when workers run to us, they are badly beaten, uh, those hurt feelings na talagang hindi maalis, the trauma itself, it's still there. Kahit pag-uwi nila. Yeah. So this is what I really wanted to raise, even to our government, even to our NGOs. Uh, we have to help yeah. them. Not like here in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Although, uh, we we have few workers who underwent this kind of uh, experience, but not gangrene. It's more on harassment, mm-hmm. okay? Not se- uh, mm-hmm. sexual harassment, but uh, it's just more on um, not no body contact. It's just uh, in the workplace, okay? So still, workers have this kind of experience of this. Uh, they were, uh, they felt they were abused, but uh, sad to note, there is no one to run to, especially yeah. in the medical, uh, for medical practitioners here in, in Japan. Uh, the language itself, it's very difficult, okay? It's very difficult for them to open it up here because uh, they cannot understand its other. Although, we we reach out to NGOs like uh, the church, some community Filipino community, re- who can just give them some sort of uh, stress debriefing. But really, still, we really need yeah. uh, uh, an institution or 
just uh, yeah. a person itself who can attend to this worker. Uh, this afternoon's topic is really beautiful. I really love this. And I hope we can tap we can tap you to have one webinar with our workers here. Because the last time we had with Ogat Foundation, uh, 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 but this afternoon, really, I, I learned a lot. And I wanted to tap uh, Dr. Paz and Dr. Uh, Dr. Cherry, and so with Mom Carmelita to help us to come up with a webinar like this for Japan trainees and workers as well, because this really is very, very helpful to our workers here. And that's what I can share, uh, Mr. Bro uh, Sir Broiland, that actually we have to have a policy in our government because we're sending workers all over. It's not only us welfare officers who can attend to them, as like what you have said. We can just deal on the yeah. uh, unpaid salaries. It's a work, uh, labor related cases, but the mental case that we're dealing here, it's something different. Yeah. Thank you, uh, well, for Amy, uh, for the inside perspective. And I think you reaffirm a lot of the concerns uh, that a lot of our experts have actually highlighted. And your reaction too, uh, really uh, reinforce how, you know, these problems that we're seeing have deeper reciprocal effects on frontline officials too. And in some cases, it often leaves emotional scar even after, yeah. they, leave, even after they leave their post. So I think I want to go back to Dr. Maria Paz. Yes, I mean, yes. using the strategies um, and coping mechanisms that you've highlighted, um, what would you suggest, uh, not just to our frontline officials, but also to migrant workers who are also currently facing these problems? I mean, you've come up with different uh, strategies as well as Dr. Jerry as well, but I want to hear from you first. Yeah, I, I always uh, go for the preventive measure, no? I mean, you know that this will happen, it may happen, so you already get yourself ready, no? It's preventive in a way that you arm yourself. For me, it's very important, but again, it requires government help, institution, no? To make our workers ready when they go out. Kung ako lang, I won't let them go out to these places where it's very dangerous that we know already. So I, I don't understand why they're allowed to do that. It might be politics, uh, ec economy, etc. No, but that information is very important so that at least before our workers would go there, they have that kind of mindset. No, and if ever this will happen, they know where to go. What are the the what they call this what are what is plan a plan b plan c no that's very important i would also go for yung sinabi nga ni, ni mom from tokyo no you see the briefing is very important because she's still traumatized sa nangyari eh, no so as as uh, even when you have your training as uh, psychosocial first aid and all very important also is uh, the debriefing who will give that debriefing to this uh, to our psychosocial helpers, no, yung mga frontliners natin, because the mere, uh, they've listened to the story, of course, no, they, yeah. they also get affected by it. So that's also another thing that we also have, no, to look into caring for them and also yeah. the self care of, of our uh, migrant workers. Um, I think before we move to the last question, Dr. Jerry, uh, I think you do have. Uh, more insights on this. Um, I'd like to give you the floor. Uh, I think uh, I, I would like to re-emphasize what uh, my colleague Dr. Pass mentioned about uh, taking care of oneself. You cannot give what you do not have. You always have to start with yourself. You have to strengthen yourself. And uh, to strengthen yourself, you have to know your ABC. Itong sabi ng Everything that we learn, we learn from kindergarten. <laughs> a, B, C, D. So, a, so you, you have to be aware. No? Uh, ang pupuntahan ko ba uh, is safe enough? Kasi sometimes they will tell you it's safe. But once you are there, uh, you are not in control. Pipalitan ang kontrata mo, papalitan ang dissemination. Yeah. One case. Sa akala, yeah. sa katarsya. And then pala, 
pupunta sa Saudi Arabia. Oh, wala uh-huh. siya magawa. So that's one. Uh, you may be ready, but uh, you are not in control of, of the... Well, so you said, mercy, balance. So what will you do now? So how will you uh, balance yourself in a way that you don't get overwhelmed? So perhaps uh, you have to ready yourself with all this uh, connectivity thing, like uh, people to contact, don't yeah. lose your connection with family. Kasi once you are there, yeah. kinukuha yung number ng, ng uh, passport mo, hindi ka na rin makakontact. No? O ang cellphone mo, like in Singapore there was once, kinukuha yung cellphone nila and it's only returned after the end of the week. The excuse there is hindi ka makatrabaho kung hinahawakan mong cellphone mo. So that also makes them uh, at the mercy of the employer. No? Mm-hmm. So, kailangan balance. Eh. So, how can you balance if yeah. you don't have any support? Mm-hmm. Okay? You are in a new place, you're in a new country, you don't know the language, yeah. you don't know anybody, you just take care of yourself. So, pag wala ka balance, madali ka mawindan. Yeah. And, uh, and see, what is your control? Okay? So, the everything, no? uh, you still have the last uh, decision. No? The bottom line, will you allow it? Kasi sometimes you can decide not to decide. No? That's a decision. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, information that is necessary to make a good decision, then that will help you also. Mm-hmm. No? Uh, really take control of your life. So, mm-hmm. this is very critical. Thank you, Dr. Jerry, uh, for your point. I do like what you're, you know, how you're approaching it. You're taking, you know, legal structures, political and institutional structures, and you argue that this is actually what produces mental health precariousness for our migrant workers. And that's why Dr. Maria Pan's work is so important because how can we actually come up with bottom-up collaboration, you know, with our diplomatic missions, with our migrant communities? And I, I think these are important, important discussions that need to be highlighted. And I think. Um, our social welfare attaché, Miss um, Amy's uh, point about having a need with this policy. How can we think about our criteria for deploying workers to these uh, regions? Yeah. I mean, should we actually incorporate this yeah. and under what conditions? Because again, our country also has, you know, economic interests, uh, interstate uh, yeah. relationships with these countries. So we have, we also have to calculate that. I think I, I was told we are running out of time, but I think I want to end with Kim question. I think his question is very important. Given all these services, knowledge, expert advice, NGOs work, advocacies, etc. How do we bring in all these services and actually create the needed reform or change to close these gaps? Um, Kim even said that, yes, these are important. These professional help are very important, but they're also expensive and non-accessible. And I think um, Ms. Amy's point is very important, inviting the experts who actually test it out in destination countries. So how do we bring all of these perspectives and resources into a meaningful genuine reform in the long run? Dr. Jerry, I want to start with you. Uh, I think there are people who are willing to help, but only we don't know how to top them. <laughs> like in this case, uh, we may not be aware, like sa atin sa, sa sabi ni Ma'am sa Tokyo. Gusto siyang tumulong, pero hindi niya alam kung sino lalapitan niya. So, hindi, mahirap din. No? So, yeah. so uh, this is where uh, the NGOs and uh, uh, collaboration with uh, professionals and with the uh, educational uh, sector will come in. Because we have so many good experts, actually. But uh, it's a matter of identifying them and asking for their help or else we will miss the opportunity. No? Kung sa kwan pa, uh, it's already there, but we didn't tap them. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, yun siguro ang, ang take ko sa... And Dr. Maria Paz? Yeah, I guess it's very important to when you do it, when you go into planning, you strategize, no? It's, I mean, uh, look at the priorities. What are the pro- uh, priorities of these embassies and all? What would be best? Like, maybe if you take care of your mental health and all, you will find out later the less problems. It will be even more uh, effective and efficient in terms of gastos because you already have addressed that problem. So perhaps if, if someone would be in, would go in also from the perspective of uh, mental health, looking at it that this action would cause this, 
putting it maybe a statistician economist that putting it in what what will the expense be compared to if they have this training so i guess it's really a collabor collab collabor uh, collab what you call this? We should collaborate with one another, no? Because I mean, psychologists, mental health experts, we don't we don't count like money. We count lives and quality of life. But maybe economics would would look into this would happen and it would gain more in terms of investment for the country. So maybe we have to ano to, look at it from a common perspective of wanting to help our uh, countrymen. I think Maria Paz to, to Jerry's point, but very important. And I think uh, this is what Lucisa Villanueva is also highlighting that, quote that you know, she said that we need to intensify uh, in regulating uh, functions of the government over recruitment and placement of agencies. We need to think through these, you know, as well as the PIDOs and PAOs that we have. Uh, how can we incorporate mental health more strategically yeah, yeah. within our existing migration governance? And aside from uh, PIDOS, I think there's a comment from the community-based service section uh, that uh, perhaps create a directory of agencies or volunteers who can provide mental health support uh, for our migrant workers. And I, I think these are healthy discussions. I think I agree with Dr. Cherry and Dr. Maria Paz that it's a matter of injecting them and actually forming meaningful collaboration. We do have what we need. It's a matter of synergizing yeah. them and actually having that political will to do it. So I think yeah. issues of national interest priorities need to be questioned more vigorously, uh, both in House Senate uh, and in Philippine politics overall. So I, I will turn over now our forum to Ms. Carmelita. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure uh, to host um, our talk for Ms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Freudan. Um, before I thank the others, uh, I would like to invite um, everyone uh, to the three remaining to the three remaining webinars for October. So on Saturday we'll have webinar number two on gender-based violence and migrant rights. It will be from two to four again. And uh, the webinar number three is on stress management and coping strategies for resilience building. Uh, we will have Dr. J and uh, Dr. again as speakers. And the third one, webinar four, will be on strengthening family relations on October 24, Saturday, 2 to 4 p.m. We will have as our speakers, Dr. J and uh, Ms. Aileen. Uh, and aside from that, um, I think uh, we talk about caring for the caregivers. Uh, in November, we'll have another four series wherein uh, the participants we hope will be more of the caregivers, our social workers, our psych, uh, psychologists, uh, our attaches. You know? So um, we hope you can also uh, join us in November, aside from the three now. You know? So um, thank you very much, um, Prof. Oyi and uh, Mr. Martin Norman for your welcome and opening remarks. And of course, our um, uh, speakers, our presenters, for um, the very uh, insightful and uh, very timely uh, presentations. No? And I'd like to thank um, Ma'am Ami, because she just confirmed her participation at noon today, because she's uh, very busy. So I was glad when she sent me a message that she's joining. Thank you for sharing your personal experience. I think it gave you know, to the many discussions that we have. Of course, we all have experiences as NGOs uh, of the experiences that uh, Ma'am Ami shared. You know? That's why uh, we would like also to our government to look into policies uh, the policies may be there, but maybe the implementation is lacking or the monitoring is lacking so that uh, uh, our uh, migrant workers are not, um, what, uh, they don't know how to uh, support or how they can be helped or sometimes uh, maybe it's taking time. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, like the presentation of Dr. J, 
maybe the, the, the rope is broken, no? So uh, sometimes it's too late. That's why we always say timely interventions are very important. No? Because sometimes we don't know that these workers who need, who need help or interventions, sometimes they are nearing, no? nearing the what? Uh, they're losing their hope really. If these things happen, it makes us even sadder. We hope our government no? uh, should consider the social cost of migration. If we can help So I think uh, we should, um, yeah, we can discuss more policies. And I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be having series of webinars starting this October and until February next year in partnership with the British Embassy. And the last webinars will be uh, like discussing with the government agencies on uh, uh, policy recommendations and what we can do to help our workers. So we hope that you can join these webinars again. Um, we can plan uh, what we can do next. Like what uh, Ma'am Ami said, actually Dawn started its work by helping our entertainers in Japan in 1996. And until now, as you mentioned, our women who have been violated while they were working in Japan until now, that trauma. No? So that's why we're very glad that we met Dr. Je, Dr. Pass, and Ms. Eileen, no? and other um, friends, because we would like to um, do something to help our women. Of course, we do a lot of activities to help them, but we think they can help like the one we discussed today. No? Because we know that it keeps on coming back to them. No? They, they have to be healed completely. No? And they could only be healed completely through professional help. No? So we hope that we can continue working together, educating to each other uh, for the sake of our migrant workers, especially the women. No? So thank you very much. And we will send you the reminders to our next webinars and the, what, the links. Uh, please give us time to send you the links because we know we sent everyone links. But today, messages, please send the link, please send the link. So maybe if you can send us messages or if you can confirm receipt of the links, no? so that if you don't have the links, we can resend it all. So thank you very much. And we hope next time our attaches uh, from DSWD, I, I think five of them, you know, but maybe they had other works to do. You know? So we hope they can join us next time. So thank you very much again for your time. And we hope to see each other again on Saturday, next Wednesday and Saturday. And for November, December, January, February. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Keep Bye. Safe. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. God bless. Mommy, thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, Bye. Thank you.